Hi there. In this video, I want to talk about building a variac for my lab, which is that big unit you see there. It's at 13.7 kilos, totally the heaviest piece of equipment I've ever put together. You may not be familiar with a variac, which is a special kind of transformer. You're probably familiar with a standard transformer having a primary and secondary coil on the same iron core. The ratio of the number of turns basically determines if the output voltage on the secondary side is higher or lower than the input on the primary. The important thing is that the primary and secondary are not connected electrically, which is why this type is called an isolation transformer. If, for example, the primary is connected to 230 volts mains and the secondary delivers, say, 12 volts, it's safe to touch the secondary on an isolation transformer because it is isolated from mains. There's a different type of transformer out there called an auto transformer, where the secondary coil and its isolation material have been eliminated, making this a much cheaper construction. Instead, the output reuses a part of the input coil. This may look superficially like a resistive divider, but it's not. The ratio of input to output voltage is still determined by the ratio of the number of turns in use by each side. For example, you can buy an auto transformer that makes 240 volts out of 120 volts input, which would be impossible if this were a resistive type of divider. The important thing to remember is that the auto transformer is not isolating. So even if the output is, say, just 12 volts, it's not safe to touch because you are still electrically connected to mains. In all these cases so far, the transformer ratio is fixed at the point when the transformer is made. If you bought a transformer for 12 volts and now you rather have 24 volts instead, you need to buy a different transformer. Of course, you may have chosen an isolation or auto transformer that provides additional taps. For example, one for 6 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, but that incurs costs, so the number of taps is generally very limited. The variable transformer solves that by providing an unlimited number of taps and therefore freely selectable AC output voltage, hence variac. It is a special kind of auto transformer using a slider arrangement that connects the output to any position of the coil, a bit like a potentiometer for resistance. A variac is expensive to make, so it's not a transformer to adjust once and never touch again. Instead, you use it as a test device to provide a selectable AC voltage for many purposes. Just don't forget, it's an auto transformer, so its output even at low voltages is always directly connected to mains. There are many variacs out there. The difference in price is mainly determined by the maximum output current or power they can handle and whether they are already wired up in an enclosure, ready to use, or just the transformer itself. I picked this one, which is rated for 1000 watts or 3.5 amps, and you have to do everything yourself, enclosure, mounting and wiring, which suits me just nice, but if you are planning to do something like this, you need to be aware and familiar with safe handling and wiring of mains voltage. If that's not the case, you should better get one of the ready-made ones. I like that this model uses a rotating round carbon brush for the slider, which hopefully wears better than the usual rectangular ones that glide over the windings. The other thing you notice on the spec, this is a large unit and just the transformer itself already weighs 8 kilos. From the manufacturer I downloaded this drawing. You can see the idea is to fix it with three 6mm balls onto some front plate. It may not be terribly obvious, but that means you need a rather substantial front plate because the whole transformer weight of 8 kilos is hanging on it. The other important bit on this drawing is the wiring diagram here. This transformer has a choice of two input connections for the live wire. If you connect it to L2, which is the very end of the coil, then the output can go as high as the input voltage, which is when the slider basically touch L2. So at an input of 240 volts, you get 0 to 240 volts as an output. Instead, I choose the second option to connect the input live wire to L1. This means the coil portion above L1 now provides additional 12% of extra voltage. 
At 240 volts input, when the slider touches L1, you get 240 volts. But turning further up to L2, you get almost 270 volts as output. Nice! I just want to briefly mention the CT terminal. This is the center tap of the winding. It is not a normal output, but used in a very specialized wiring scheme called buck boost, where the variac is basically used to add or subtract to an existing supply voltage. Without going into details, it basically allows you to have a separate fixed transformer to provide the bulk of the power to the load and the variac only has to handle the portion added or subtracted, which means you can use a cheaper variac or drive substantially higher loads. For now at least I won't use the CT terminal. I am reusing an old enclosure that once contained a DC power supply, hence the two large round holes that contain analog volt and amp meters. For this new application, I'm going to use the rear as the new front plate, which means I will have to cover off the big holes somehow. Although the enclosure is made of steel, I don't think the U-shaped front plate itself would be able to hold the weight of the transformer without deforming. Plus, I have then the three substantial M6 bolt heads sticking out on the front. To solve both problems, I designed this bracket. All parts were actually bought on eBay. All I did is drill the holes in the plate. The plate itself is mild steel, 3mm thick, and the two supports were sold as rustic heavy duty shelf brackets. They are made of 30mm steel, 6mm thick. A definite overkill, I agree, but at less than 10 pounds for the pair, why not? The idea is that this plate will hold the transformer and the plate itself will be mounted on the floor of the enclosure using the angle brackets. I gave my new transformer mount a coat of paint and drilled the necessary holes for the transformer. One large center one for the shaft and three for the mounting. And here's the beast, ready mounted in its new home. You can see the round brush wheel that this transformer uses to contact the windings. This is the packet during a trial fitting as it's going to be inside the enclosure. I added 10mm aluminium rod as an extension of the shaft of the transformer which I will cut down to size later. I could not find a suitable coupling adapter so I used two of these mounted back to back. The thing you see on the winding of the transformer is the center tab mentioned earlier. When I turn the shaft extension rod, you can see the carbon brush wheel rotating over the windings. I was curious what kind of resistance a wheel made of carbon has. Less than one ohm, which is pretty reassuring. I want to show you how I plan to fix the large holes in the rear. First, I'm adding an IEC C14 socket with built-in fuse holder as a power inlet. It thankfully covers my less than perfect cutout. For the rest, I found this aluminium air vent cover, which fits perfectly after removing a corner for the power inlet. It covers the holes, looks really good and it provides ample ventilation. This is the completed rear panel. I'm really happy with this solution, which turned out to be so easy to make. On to the front panel now. The front panel just fits on an A4 sheet of paper. I took the inspiration for the dial from a self-adhesive one that came with the transformer by replicating it in LibreOffice Draw allowed me to just print it as part of the front panel, which is way easier than getting the adhesive one aligned correctly, plus it allows for the additional red background for greater than 100% output. The separate mounting brackets for the variac means there are no ugly bolt heads to worry about on the front. This makes for a very clean and neat look. The two blue areas represent cutouts for the output socket and the panel meter. Once laminated, I cut out the necessary holes using a sharp knife. I only wish it was as easy to cut the metal of the enclosure. I have a separate video about making laminated front panels this way and Add a link in the description. This is the front panel fully assembled. The panel meter is the DY69-2048, which I modified in another video so that it has independent supply and measurement inputs. 
For a variac, this is needed because otherwise your panel meter will stay dark until the voltage exceeds 70 volts or so. The eagle-eyed will have spotted that the output socket is upside down. There's actually no right or wrong way with the UK power socket, but it's better if the earth pin is on top, because then the plug's cable exits cleanly at the bottom instead of first looping upwards. Another point is that this is actually a socket for motorhomes and caravans. I found that they are significantly cheaper than panel mounted UK sockets. Normally these motorhome sockets are mounted from the rear and you can buy an extra frame to cover the top, but I figured doing the precision cutout needed for this method was way too much work, given that it still looks reasonable when mounted from the front, hiding my rough cutout job. The variac itself is missing because wiring the front panel is much easier without it in the way. And speaking of wiring, let's have a look at the schematics. There isn't all that much to wire up. On the input we have the C14 socket with built-in fuse. That is a 4 amp slow type protecting the variac, which is rated at 3.5 amps, but of course it's not 100% efficient, so the current coming in is a bit more than 3.5 amps, and then there's the consumption of the panel meter itself. The switch S1 is a double pole type and has a built-in light. The panel meter supply goes through a fuse. I was debating with myself whether I should add a fuse and whether it should be in the live or neutral wire. In the end I added it into the neutral wire since the sense input is connected to live as well and I figured having two live connections remaining may be less harmful than a fuse in the supply live wire and after it blows, live still coming in through the sense input. In the center we have of course the variac itself. The output of the variac goes through the current transformer of the panel meter and then through fuse F3 before being connected to the output socket and measured by the sense input of the panel meter. That way if F3 goes, the voltage shown on the panel meter will also drop to zero. The fuse F3 is actually a resettable thermal magnetic circuit breaker rated for 3 amps. That is less than what the transformer can handle, but the breaker needs a bit of an overload to even respond. My idea is that this resettable circuit breaker is the main device to protect the expensive variac from permanent damage, but as a last resort there's the additional slow 4 amp fuse in the input. This kind of breaker has the usual bimetallic contact that will eventually trip if sufficiently heated through the overload current, but that process is relatively slow. To make it trip quickly at spikes and shorts, there is an additional electromagnet inside that opens the contacts in the current and therefore the magnetic field exceeds the threshold. If you look at the datasheet, in particular this table, you see that a 3 amp breaker will not trip unless the current exceeds 3 amps, although it states that 145% overload, that would be 4.3 amps, will trip it in one hour. There is considerable variance in that, and in my case the breaker trips a lot earlier, which is just what I want. I'm toying with the idea of designing an electronic overload protection circuit myself using the current transformer that is part of the panel meter as a sensor. This here is the way I mounted the current transformer. The plastic tie wraps can be replaced if necessary. It is important that these are not conductive to avoid shortening the transformer magnetically. The wiring isn't the prettiest. The mains rated 1.5mm solid core wire is rather stiff and over the course of the build I had to change the wiring a couple of times. For example when I turned the output socket around and so the neatness has suffered a bit. The red wire contains the fuse to the panel meter. The cable color is red because that's what the inline fuse holder came with. Despite its DC only look the fuse holder and the wire is rated for 250 volts AC 10 amps. A side view shows the wires ready for hooking up the variac. The small terminal block on the right is convenient to sort out the connections to the other end of these wires, though there is just one wire each to the variac terminals. In a build like this it's very important for electrical safety that the earth is properly connected. You can just make out the two earth leads, one coming from the input connector and the other going to the output connector. 
These two will be connected to each other and the chassis using one of the bolts that mount the variac bracket in the enclosure after removing the paint and using serrated washers to ensure proper electrical contact. This is the same view with the variac added. What looked like a lot of empty space before is now pretty much filled up. Here is another look at the shaft coupling. This is the first run without any load. The lowest voltage isn't quite zero, but close enough. At 50% it's close to 120 volts, which means my scale is reasonably correct. Of course, the exact value depends on the input voltage at the moment. And the same is true for the maximum voltage, which is almost 265 volts. Let's test it with a 60 watt incandescent light bulb. You can see the filament in the bulb glowing brighter and brighter and the current and watt readout increases with the voltage. As incandescent bulbs are becoming hard to get, I stop at 100% or 230 volts. It consumes 230 milliamps and using close to the specified 60 watts. Its apparent power is of course the same, because the power factor is a solid 1.000. As a full load test, I connected a fan heat to the output. That would nominally exceed the rating of the transformer, so I reduced the voltage a little to stay just at about the 3.5 amp mark. This load should eventually trigger the 3 amp circuit breaker, and I'm using the stopwatch to test how long that takes. I was just about to start measuring the temperature using the infrared thermometer when at 15 minutes and 32 seconds the breaker triggered. The breaker is now so hot that it does not allow you to reset it by pressing the button back in. You need to let it cool down first. At 17 minutes 27 you can hear a click and see a small movement which means the bimetallic strip is now cool enough and pressing the button back in resets the breaker and enables power. That works just as I hope it would. In practice I plan to stay under the 3 amp load and this is really just to cover my mistakes in operating or failures in the load circuit. And that's it for this build. If you liked the video and would like to see more, consider subscribing and now you can also become a Patreon to get early access to all my videos as well as exclusive content. There's a link in the description of the video. Thanks for watching.